Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, please turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Our focus text this morning will be verses 1 through 3, but I'll read through verse 6 for context. Before we hear the reading and the preaching of God's word, let's go before him together in prayer, asking him to illumine our hearts and our minds to the very truth of his word. Let's pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we confess that we cannot understand it rightly without your help, without your work in us by your spirit. And so, Lord, we do come before you now praying that you would open our hearts and our minds, that you would show us Christ, show us how we must live in these verses, Lord, and make it uh, very tangible and give us great zeal to do so, we pray. We pray that Christ would be honored, and we pray that you would be glorified, in all ways and everything. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Hear now the very word of God written for you and for me today. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering. Bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Are the reading of his word. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word to us. Well, beloved, Paul would agree with the psalmist who calls God's people in Psalm 33 to rejoice in the Lord, for praise from the upright is beautiful. We know that Paul wasn't a man who only taught the saints to praise and to honor and to glorify God. He also led by example. Paul himself was in the practice of doing so with open lips and with sincere heart. As a faithful servant and a student of Christ and his word, Paul's doctrine, his theology, led him to doxology. We considered the second occasion of Paul's description of praise last week. It was wonderful as Paul gave all praise and honor to the one who is able. Our God has all the power. He has supreme authority. He is completely able. He has unlimited resources of grace at his disposal and call. There is no limit for what our God can do and achieve for his people. We can't ask him to do too much or for too many blessings, knowing that He has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, knowing that God hears each one of our prayers and answers them according to his perfect and holy will. God knows what is good, even best, for us. He knows what our true needs are better than we do ourselves. And so... We praise and we honor, we glorify the God who is able to do uh, exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. We make our longest lists and ponder our deepest thoughts about what we could ask or need, and we could do that. But the awesome reality is that none of our best can even come remotely close to tapping God out. Whatever we may ask or think to ask, he is still able to do more. Let this quiet the heart of the doubtful this morning. Let this calm the anxious. 
and let it uplift the discouraged. For that indeed was the reason why Paul even gave these words in this focus. Our God can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. It's mind-blowing and praise-inducing, isn't it? And that's where Paul's heart was and where ours should be. How great is our God! How immense and glorious is He! He is truly uh, worthy of all of our praise and for all glory. Indeed, like Paul said, to Him be the glory in the church, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so as we stand on this foundation of truth and rich biblical doctrine that Paul has imparted to us in the first three chapters, he then goes on to encourage us and teach us about how we must then live. The doctrine Paul taught us in chapters 1 through 3 is designed not just to be head knowledge, but rather doctrine is to be applied to life. Doctrine is to be applied to life. Doctrine should ground and guide and grow us in godly living, in our walk with Christ. And so this morning we will see how our walk should be a natural result of our salvation in Christ. We'll consider the need for our walk in verse 1. Important components of our walk in verse 2 and the purpose of our walk in verse 3. So look at verse 1 and what Paul says there regarding the need for our walk. He says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And notice that word, therefore. He's connecting what he's about to say as the reason that is being built on, that is launching from what he has just told us. We notice that similar to chapter uh, chapter 3, verse 1, Paul mentions to the saints that he is a prisoner of the Lord. Now, why does he mention this again here? Paul wasn't ashamed of his chains. He wasn't ashamed of his bonds. We know that. He desired to reiterate the importance of the people knowing that the pure gospel of Christ and biblical doctrine in his word was worth suffering for. It was worth suffering for, and likewise, God's people should give careful attention to his instruction about faithful, godly Christian living. Because even in that, and in living faithful, godly Christian lives, we will suffer for doing so. And so considering Paul's status as a prisoner of the Lord is right and timely and good in considering the importance of what he is saying. And in considering that importance, Paul, notice, beseeched the saints. He urged them. In essence, he said, because of the great things that are true of God in his person, in his being, in who he is. Considering the great things that I've told you about the work of our God in Christ, in the work of redemption, considering the great things that I've told you and the mystery revealed about how Christ is brought together his people in his church, Jews and Gentiles united together in Christ, being built up on the one solid foundation being in uh, in communion and in unity with one another, considering all of these things, please, saying, I beseech you, be mindful and attentive to what I'm about to say and teach you regarding how those glorious truths are then to be applied in your daily lives. For my friends, a Christ-like identity must lead to a Christ-like life. A Christ-like identity must lead to a Christ-like life. And so what did Paul urge the saints to do? To walk, 
to specifically walk worthily, he says. Now, Paul has already primed his words here with those that he told us in chapter 2. And turn back to chapter 2, if you would. We'll look at a couple of these for a moment. In chapter 2, where he spoke of both our depraved walk contrasted against our redeemed walk. Our depraved walk against our redeemed walk. Remember in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2, Paul said there, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, who now works in the sons of disobedience. That was the life that we once lived. That was the walk that we once went in and through day in and day out. But then in verse 10, note what he says there. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are going to see this word walk and Paul's description, Paul's teaching, Paul's expansion on this many, many times in the rest of this epistle. And so Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, are really just the beginning of the meat that Paul will put on the bones of the walk that he spoke of in chapter 2, verse 10. And so notice that Paul's focus isn't only that we walk. Yes, that's important but also and specifically on the manner and the quality of our walk. We are called to walk worthy of the calling in which we've been called. The call of God, my friends, has been effectual in our hearts through the gospel. And so Paul desired that the saints in Thessalonica, for example... He also spoke to them, saying in chapter 2, verse 12, that they would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Notice that. Walking worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And later in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 7, he also said, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. So here, even to the Thessalonians, he adds some helpful pieces, a, a, a window into the view and beginning to look at what does that worthy walk look like? What are important pieces and things that we need to be aware of as we consider such worthy walking? We can't just say that we're Christians and then live like the devil. Our lives, our walk, must be different. We have a glorious salvation in and through our Lord Jesus Christ, who then calls us to then put on display our heavenly citizenship. That which Paul just taught Ephesus about in the preceding chapters. To show forth that we belong to Jesus which should be evident in how we live for him. As we have been created in Christ for good works, we are also to walk in them. And that's what worthy walking looks like. Now you may hear this and you may be thinking, well, pastor, I, I struggle in walking worthily a lot. So many ups and downs, so much stumbling and falling. If I'm honest, maybe up until hearing Paul's words and considering this beginning of how he's uh, putting those meat, to, putting that meat to the bones of this walk, maybe I haven't really completely understood it. Maybe I'm still even learning even beyond this. 
Well, my friends, you're not alone, right? I do. We all do. We all stumble and fall, and we do not walk worthily as we should. Yet praise God for his giving us men like Paul to teach us, to remind us of what we need to do and should be doing to guide us in the straight and the narrow path. And also praise the God who is able. Again, there's a reason for why Paul gave us that foundation. Because as he's calling us to walk and as he knows that none of us walks worthily, and none of us does that perfectly, he wants us to be standing on and thinking about and putting into practice then what the realities and the glorious truth is regarding the God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more, the God who works in us by his Spirit to pursue holiness, to live lives that give God glory, to do the worthy walking. We can only do so by his grace. Amen? And what should this walk look like? Well, Paul starts to flesh that out for us in, in verse 2. He says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Now let's look at these four characteristics that should be present in us as well as among us, notice. Because that is a big focus of Ephesians. Yes, it has individual application, but it also has corporate application as we are learning what it is to walk as the body of Christ. And so he begins with lowliness. Now this lowliness is having a humble opinion of yourself, having a deep sense of our moral littleness. It's humility and its very core, which is the inside-out virtue that is produced when we compare ourselves to the Lord rather than to others. That's really where humbleness strikes at the core, and we find its purity, and we find its truth. It's not when we're comparing ourselves to other people, but when we're looking at our Lord, at our God. In other words, it's not having a pharisaical heart. It's keeping the little Pharisee in all of us, maybe for some of us, the big Pharisee, um, keeping that at bay, mortifying it. Not being self-inflated by our sinful egos. Paul, in fact, spoke of his own journey in lowliness to the elders in Ephesus, in Acts chapter 20, verse 19, where he said, Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Paul endured great persecution. The Jews were after him. But yet he continued to put one foot in front of the other. He continued to get up in the morning and continued to preach Christ with all of his heart. To seek to live a godly life. To be an example to the people of God. To serve and to, to be obedient to his Lord, first and foremost. In all humility. You know, it's interesting to think of Paul having tears. He was a man. He was a spirit blessed and a man that the Lord worked mightily in by his spirit. But it wasn't all fun and games. In fact, probably never was. It was hard in the Christian life for Paul, but it was a journey that he knew was worth walking in service to his Lord and his people. Peter teaches us in 1 Peter 5 that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we need to remember that when that Pharisee inside wants to rear its head and raise up and try to take control. 
Beloved, we know this, that the struggle in walking isn't just the stumbling and the falling part. It's also the endurance and the perseverance that we press forward in while serving in, in humility that is so hard. The difficulty in humility is also evident as we are sinners in the midst of, of and walking with other sinners. And call, Paul calls us to such living as we walk with God and also as we walk as a body. We're bumping up against each other. We're offending each other. We're getting into points of conflict. There's lots of opportunity for that. And sometimes that takes place. But what are we going to do with it? Are we going to let it burn and fester? Are we going to seek to do what's right in the Lord's eyes and according to his word and reconcile and seek to uh, continue to walk rightly before him and with one another? And so importantly then, Paul also exhorts us in verse 2 of chapter 4 of Ephesians to bear the fruit of gentleness. This is one of the fruits of the Spirit. You may be well familiar with that in Galatians 5. It can also be viewed as meekness. Another good definition of gentleness is that of controlled strength. Controlled strength. Gentleness and self-control are closely related. And Paul even spoke of it in regards to our Lord Jesus Christ, did he not? Where he spoke of him interacting with the saints, with the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Those two were very present in our Lord Jesus Christ. And remember even the manner in which Paul addressed the sin in Corinth. Corinth had a lot of problems. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 18 through 21 said, Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And notice verse 21, What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod? or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Shall I come to you with the rod, or shall I come to you in a spirit of love and gentleness? Paul could have brought the rod as an ambassador, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, concerned about their great sin. Whip them into shape. Bring that rod. And indeed, he did by God's working through him, in his ministry to him, even in the epistles that we have from him to the church in Corinth, we know that he brought a great measure of spiritual discipline and correction to them. But by what means? Paul came to them with controlled strength. And further. We know that God isn't arbitrary or chaotic in the use of his power. We see time and again in the scriptures how our omnipotent God controls his power and is gentle with us, his people. Part of worthy walking is imitating that controlled strength, that self-control when we deal with other people. We need to be gentle with those, even and especially those who we find hard and even the hardest to deal with and love. But Paul follows the fruit of gentleness by speaking to our need for long-suffering or patience. Now, the Greek word for long-suffering, makrothumia, is the same word in both Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, where Paul lists it as a fruit of the Spirit, as well as in this passage here in Ephesians 4, among others. It's otherwise translated as forbearance or even as patience. 
But macrothumia is an interesting word that helps us to know under what patience is. And it helps us in that regard, knowing uh, that it's made up of two words, macro, which means long, and thumos, which means passion or anger. F.F. F. Bruce, in his commentary on Galatians, noted that this word embraces steadfastness and staying power. If in, if in English we had an adjective long-tempered as a counterpart to being short-tempered, then macrothumia would be called the quality of being long-tempered. Now notice here the connections and the flow of these characteristics. This being the third, we'll see the fourth in a moment. But Paul didn't just put his hand in a grab bag and lay out the first four that were in his hand. No, these are intentional and important, determined by God himself. And see how the lowly in heart should walk in, control, in controlled strength as we deal with one another, being long-tempered with each other. See also how these things aren't as Focus on our Christian life when things are peachy keen. They definitely speak to that, but they are also speaking to when life in the church crosses over into the challenging and difficult. And that's important even as we consider verse 3. But before we get to verse 3, notice this fourth fruit and characteristic. Paul goes on to connect such patience to love. We are called to bear with one another in love. And this adds nicely to the meaning and the application of gentleness, doesn't it? Paul is teaching us about what love should look like. And of course, the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 is also of great kind of honing help here, defining help as it gives and shares words that fill in this picture. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, You'll see what I mean there. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love doesn't envy. It doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Again, see this flowing connection of patience, long-suffering, controlled strength, humbleness. All these things bear very well and help us then when we're talking about that purpose of that worthy walking in verse 3. In verse 3, he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The purpose Paul puts forward here is the peace and the unity of the church. So as Christ has redeemed a people, as he has brought redeemed sinners together to serve him and to worship him, in this body, peace and unity are two things that must be preserved and maintained in Christ's glorious bride. And beloved, such maintenance and preservation takes effort. It takes effort. We must never forget that. Peace and unity among sinners doesn't just it's spirit wrought. It's a work of the Spirit of God in the people of God. And this is why Paul says such fruit must be active in our lives, for uh, as they are present, they support this peace and unity. They are part of the picture and of the action of the feet on the ground, the boots on the ground, the actual working out of the preservation of this unity. And so this is also why Paul calls us to endeavor. 
Endeavoring means making haste, having zeal, being eager and diligent to do something. And therefore, peace and unity must be our focused pursuit. And this is what our pursuit must look like. You know, we can't be lazy when it comes to peace and unity in the body of Christ. We are to have that eagerness and diligence note to keep it, Paul said. Endeavor for it, but endeavor to do what? To keep it. And this keeping, it's the same, same idea, same concept as even Adam was given in the garden when he was to tend and to keep it. What was he to do? He was to guard, which he failed. But regarding this peace and unity in Christ's body, we are to guard and to watch over it. And what does that mean? Why is that so important? Because we need to know that peace and unity are fragile. We need to know that they must be protected. There is much that would seek to threaten and to dash our peace and to destroy our unity. We can often have our attention drawn to threats from the outside, and it's very true. There are threats on the outside, but don't overlook that which is on the inside, even within our own hearts. And thus again, the importance of these fruits, this worthy walking that Paul is beseeching us to do before the Lord and with one another because this is the groundwork. This is the means by which we guard and protect this precious peace and unity that Christ has brought about by his own blood. That Christ gives us in him. We don't have it apart from him. If it wasn't for Christ, if it wasn't for the work of the Spirit, we would be at each other's throats so this church would disband before this time is over. But he says, keep it, protect it. God has extended much blessing in the peace and the unity of our church. But let us be good watchmen and to the work needed to preserve that unity for the glory of Christ. We need to be diligent to do it. And what does this look like as the rubber meets the road? Well, we need to have examining hearts. We need to have much God-given wisdom and discernment to see what is present, even the weeds that we need to pull even the issues and the hurts and the pains and the rubs that we need to heal. We need to guard our hearts and our minds. We need to guard our tongues. We need to keep short accounts. We need to be looking out for others' interests beyond our own. We need to be encouraging one another, doing the work and the acts of love, and loving our neighbor as we should. Loving our God with all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. We need to be diligent about doing these things daily, regularly. We need to be committed to prompt reconciliation when the needs arise. As we identify these things. We don't need to put them off. We don't need to put off the pains and the offenses. Because that will fester. Satan loves to use those easy moments to say, here's a wedge and I'm driving it deeper. No, get it out. Deal with the thorn. Resolve, reconcile in a Christ-honoring way, according to his word with our brothers and sisters. Indeed, that peace would be maintained. That unity would be maintained. We don't split hairs and we don't argue and get disputing over small issues. We seek to have charity. We seek to extend grace to 
to one another, even in all of our shortcomings. And we all have shortcomings. And so, isn't it all the more glorious even to consider what God is doing and has done in our own church to see this group of people, this flock of people walking together in peace and unity and love. It's not of us, I can tell you that. It's all of him. And yet he calls us here to keep that peace. Endeavor, be earnest, be diligent. And so I'll leave you with this. Examine your hearts and your conduct this morning. Not just one or the other, but everything. Examine your hearts and your conduct this morning. Leave this place with a biblical understanding of what worthy walking looks like. Knowing that Paul's just beginning to open up the flower here. He's just beginning to to peel back the surface of the onion, to to show the, the wonderful intricacies, to show the wonderful work of the spirit and the body in that walk. But there's a lot here. Leave with an understanding of what that looks like and prayerfully endeavor with all of your hearts to grow in your walk. The Christian life is not to be a stagnant life. The Christian life is to be a growing, a walking life where we are pressing forward as the Spirit is growing and maturing us. He's changing us. Grow in your walk. May humility and gentleness and patient love be abundant fruit on our trees and blessings to one another as we interact with and serve each other in these ways. And also may the peace and the unity of Christ's church and the maintenance thereof be freshly before our eyes today. We enjoy it today. It's wonderful. But let's guard and keep it. And we need to do so together. May we never cease in our diligence to keep and protect it for the glory of Christ. Praise God for his word. Let's pray together.